Thank you. Very nice to be here. Congratulations, Kevin, on a wonderful book. Thank you. Um, I mean that sincerely. Uh, I uh, uh, I loved uh, the uh, the way you move from the particular to the abstract, the the interpretive and uh, and the colorful detail. Uh, I was struck by so many of them, but one that particularly sticks in my mind was uh, your image of Chairman Mao in around March or April 1949, getting ready to march on Beijing and uh, listening on a scratchy phonograph uh, to uh, Chinese opera records and singing along uh, with uh, uh, Chinese opera arias. I, I didn't know, I read a lot about Mao over the years, and I didn't know that he was a music lover or a singer, for that matter. So you've added a little detail to our store of knowledge about Chairman Mao and, and many other details as well. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, just to get started, uh, your last book was on the foreign policy of Abraham Lincoln, which seems very far afield from Truman, Mao, and uh, uh, China in 1949. And so maybe I could just start by asking you how, how you made this transition from Lincoln to Mao and, and company, and why. Yeah, sure. Well, um, they're, they're very different, um, as you say. And thank you, by the way, to, to Susie and China File um, for doing this. China File is a great resource for those of us uh, who are interested in uh, in this subject. And your um, Richard's book, if you haven't read it, uh, China 1945, is fantastic. Um, really, one of the best books on on you know U.S. China policy during World War II. Uh, really enjoyed it and you you. relied on it for the book. So, um, thanks for doing this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, there are a couple of reasons why that interested me. Um, one is that, I mean, both of these two things are about a major theme in American foreign policy, which is uh, the relationship between um, nationalism and internationalism, which is something, it's, it's something that comes up again and again in foreign affairs. It's something that was a major theme in, uh, in 19th century foreign policy and, and a major theme in, in this book, in the book that I'm writing about, uh, that I'm writing now. But um, specifically for this one, in as I was finishing my last book, um, the CIA declassified um, its secret internal history uh, of covert operations around the Chinese periphery in 1949. This was not that long ago. I think it was 2011. Um, and there were a couple of copies of this document. Um, and one was um, the, the agency kept in a vault somewhere in, at Langley or wherever the, the CIA headquarters was at this time. The other one was used as a teaching tool and kind of circulated uh, among operatives. And, and it described the, the American effort at you know, the, these covert operations over the course of uh, 1949. And um, some of this had come out over the years, the broad strokes of it, but there was a lot of kind of granular detail um, about these operations, and it made for fascinating reading. When you, you know, whenever you've got some new stuff, that's always a good thing as somebody who's writing history. Uh, and this coincided with um, around the same time when Hillary Clinton wrote her article in Foreign Policy magazine, I think it was also 2011, um, where um, talking up about, for the first time, about the pivot to Asia. And so, um, you know, and in Beijing, uh, the pivot to Asia was seen as a, a modern day containment policy in a lot of ways, by some, in some quarters, by some people. And so, so my initial conceit was um, to look at sort of, you know, at, at the same time that, that Beijing is worried about containment anew, we have more information than ever before about what containment actually consisted of uh, um, at its origins in 1949. And so that was my, you know, my initial um, conceit with the book. Um, and it's become, you know, it's become kind of oddly timely in other ways, too. Um, it's now, you know, this is the year that I'm writing about, which is 1949, um, is also, it's the lead up to the Korean War as well. And so that, you know, it's obviously in the news just, you know, even this morning. Um, and so it's become timely in that way, too. But it's really, you know, it's a book about um, the birth of modern China. And more, you know, more specifically, my book is about um, that sort of what do you do about a dynamic China during this during this period? Do you engage? Do you confront? Do you contain? How do you you know how do you deal with this dilemma? Mm -hmm. Okay, well <laughs> that last remark leads me to the to sort of the big question. I mean, obviously we all know that relations with China went very bad, uh, and in fact you close the book. Uh, you know, spoiler alert here: you close the book uh, with Mao finally getting to go to Moscow and spending time in Moscow. He's very discontented. He feels he's being mistreated by Stalin. He feels insulted uh, by Stalin. 
Uh, but he's also, he also gives a speech. Uh, he's the first person to be allowed to speak at Stalin's gala 70th birthday party, and he writes back to Beijing that uh, they loved me here. He sounded a little Donald Trump-like. They loved me. Uh, they, they, they couldn't stop applauding. They gave me three standing ovations. Um, and the uh, Sino-Soviet uh, treaty, friendship treaty is, is signed, replacing the, the Sino-Soviet treaty that was signed between Chiang Kai-shek and, uh, uh, and um, Stalin in 1945, part of what I wrote about. So he's now signaled that he's in the Soviet camp. And as we know, he stayed in this, so then the Korean War comes along, uh, he stays in the Soviet camp, uh, we move the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Straits and bring about the division of China and the ongoing problem of Taiwan. So the question is, could it have been any different, or was this a an outcome that was etched in steel uh, in the historical circumstances? Was there something that the United States could have done in particular that could have brought about a different outcome? Um, I I think there, there's a lot of things that the United States could have done um, to bring about a different outcome. I'm not sure that there's anything that the United States could have done to bring about a better outcome. And I'll give you, I'll explain what I'm talking about by this. But um, there were people in, so Mao is just, you know, as a little background, Mao has, at the beginning of 1949, um, Mao has taken over um, Beijing, and he marched in, in June of that year. Um, the communists take over um, Shanghai, and then in October 1949, he stands atop the gate of heavenly peace and proclaims, you know, the um, the People's Republic of the birth of the People's Republic of China. Um, and the dilemma for Truman and his his Secretary of State um, Dean Acheson at the time were, you know, how how do you respond to this? And so there were a couple of different schools of thought during this period. Um, one school of thought, which was um, the the uh, the, the kind of the leading proponent of this was John Layton Stewart, who was the American ambassador mm -hmm. at the time, um, and he wanted to he wanted to engage with Mao. He had been a medical missionary, uh, or not a medical missionary, a, um, an educator in China um, for for years, and he had a deep um, a commitment to China, and ch the Chinese people, and um, he wanted to do his best to um, engage with Mao, and he did just that. He, he began holding um, talks with a former student of his. Um, who um, he, had, he had taught at Yanjing University, and then um, he, had, he had become, you know, he had, he had found himself in Mao's inner circle. And so he and Stewart began talking in May or um, June of 1949, and Stewart's hope is that he would be able to establish some kind of better relationship um, um, with Mao. Now, there was a, a kind of a competing faction during this um, period of time in the Truman administration, um, and this was led by Lewis Johnson, um, who was the Truman's defense secretary, um, that, that wasn't interested in engagement and, in fact, had closer ties with the nationalist regime and was more interested in um, confronting and trying to roll back Mao's advances. And um, so you've got, you know, you've got Stewart, who, who's favoring engagement. You've got um, Johnson and his allies, who are, are more interested in rollback. And Truman and Acheson are sort of caught in the middle. I mean, Acheson, um, Truman's Secretary of State, really doesn't want to think about China at all at the beginning of 1949. Mm -hmm. um, he's got a lot on his plate in Europe. He, he would rather, you know, he's got, um, remember, NATO is signed um, at the, in April of 1949. He's, there's a lot going on in Europe with Stalin maneuvering for advantage in, in Eastern Europe. He doesn't really want to, to have anything to do with this. And he sort of gives, he famously, in February of 1949, um, tells a group of congressmen, we need to wait until the dust settles before we make a decision yeah. about, about how to deal with this. Um, and so, so, so I think, you know, to answer your question, I think there are, there are things that, that the U.S. could have done differently. It could have, um, uh, it, Truman could have decided to engage with, you know, to, to hold more serious talks with Mao. I don't think, you know, personally, I don't think it would have made any difference. We know now from the material in the Soviet archives, and, you know, we know a lot more about Mao's thinking and Stalin's thinking during this period. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem likely that, um, that, um, uh, that it would have made a whole lot of difference. And, and certainly things could have been differently if, if Washington threw in its lot with, with Lewis, you know, Lewis Johnson's point of view, and it had armed the nationalists to a greater degree, they had invaded um, China. Um, as you point out, I think in your, I mean, you could have ended up with a Vietnam 10 times worse than Vietnam. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
I think things could have been different, but, um, but, but not necessarily better. Because, the, you know, the, there's a certain conventional wisdom, uh, at least it seemed to me that it was the conventional wisdom when I was in graduate school and uh, as a journalist covering China and other things, that somehow the bad relationship between China and the United States was our fault. Uh, if we had only followed the advice of the China hands, who were all, as, as we all know, uh, axed, uh, uh, chased out of the State Department and out of government during the McCarthy period, if we had only listened to them, and we had been nicer to Mao, we had not allowed the CIA to uh, engage in what seems, from the perspective of 60 or 70 years, or a little more, I guess, uh, to be really kind of silly meddling that couldn't possibly have changed the military outcome in China, but that fed Mao's uh, belief that the United States was an enemy uh, and his fear that we were going to unleash uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, and that if we hadn't done all of that, we could have had perhaps not a friendly relationship with China, but at least a, a working relationship. And if we had had the working relationship with China, maybe the Korean War wouldn't have happened. Maybe uh, Mao wouldn't have supported uh, Kim Il-sung in the invasion of South Korea. Maybe he wouldn't have sent in uh, 300,000 troops in Korea and brought about a war between China and the United States. But I have the impression from reading your book that, yes, we might have fine-tuned it, we might have done things a little bit differently, we might have made more of an effort uh, to, to be sympathetic to, to Mao, to understand him as, more as a nationalist than as a sort of an international communist, but that in the end, it wasn't going to make a difference. We, were gonna, we had to f not only have bad relations with China, but we had to have the Korean War, and then we had to have the Vietnam War. And that there isn't any, you, you don't see some sort of policy alternative that was being proposed at the time that might have avoided that. Well, I just think um, uh, Mao wasn't particular. I mean, one, I'll give you an example. One of the, the documents from this period um, we have, and this is from a Russian source who, who met with Mao in, um, uh, in, in early 1949. Mao compared um, China during this period to a dirty house. He said it's full of fleas, bedbugs, and lice. And he said, first we need to clean the house before um, we invite in um, foreign guests. And so he really, I mean, he, he, he really felt like, I mean, he, he's talking about spies. He thinks there's spies left behind, nationalist spies, um, American spies. Um, and as I mentioned, there, you know, there is some, some spying going on um, during that, that period. But um, Mao just, I mean, everything we know since the end of the Cold War is is that Mao and Stalin's relationship during this period was a lot closer than we had earlier believed. And all these, I, I, I recommend, if you're interested in this subject, you can go, you know, from your, from your desk uh, laptop to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, their digital archive, and look at the, sto the telegrams between Mao and Stalin during this period. And you really get a sense of, um, of the relationship um, between the two um, during this period. Um, and it was, you know, it was closer than... Um, than, than people had thought. There was a little burst of scholarship, um, to your point, in, in the early 80s, after the opening to China, where people asking this question, was there a lost chance to, you know, to avoid... Um, yeah. And you know, specifically, there was the Barbara Tuckman article uh, when it was discovered that Mao had sent uh, through Wiedemeyer, uh, this also, this happens in the beginning of 1945, uh, the war uh, with Japan is still going on, and Mao sends a message. Uh, he, he doesn't want Hurley, who was the ambassador, uh, to see this message. So he gets it to, to Wiedemeyer. And it asks if he and Joe and Lai can go to Washington and meet with Roosevelt and make their case to Roosevelt, their case being they want uh, American cooperation in the fight against Japan. They want American arms, in particular, uh, to help them in their, in their uh, war against the Japanese. And the... Uh, the note or the telegram or whatever it was is never passed on to Washington. And Barbara Tuckman takes the position that if it had been passed on and that if Roosevelt had responded to it, uh, Roosevelt, who was at, uh, at death's door uh, at that time, that history would have been completely different. And what you're saying is that no, history wouldn't have been completely different. Well, certainly not by 1949. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you another example, a similar example, um, in 1949, where um, the American diplomats got a piece of intelligence um, that said, that indicated that it was um, a, a piece of intelligence from inside Mao's camp that seemed to indicate that there were splits in the communist leadership, mm. that, that, um, 
um, that um, Zhou Enlai was leading a kind of a liberal wing of the party. Mao was was um, was more conservative wing of the party, and that there were there were differences of opinion about how to engage with the Americans and what to and what to do. Everything that we know about this document um, after the end of the Cold War and from interviews that scholars have done with the people who were involved is that this was probably a hoax, that it probably was an attempt at misdirection um, by, um, by Joe or Mao or whoever leaked this to, um, to try to kind of keep the Americans off balance during this period. And I think I mean, there was some of this in earlier, too, in 1945 mm-hmm. um, and um, um, in other periods, too. I mean, I think, they, it, it, you know, Mao was pretty good about that. And he was, you know, his, his biggest goal was to prevent American intervention in, uh, uh, to prevent the U.S. from doing something that would keep him from con- from finishing the job, um, and um, so um, so yeah yeah I mean he so he's concerned about his I mean think about Mao's fears he's just he's just taken Shanghai and Nanjing Beijing he's interested in in taking Taiwan and some of these offshore islands American troops had just American Marines had just left Northeast China in early 1949 and they kind of lingered on ships just off the coast during this period. Um, so the last thing Mao wants to do is to provoke the Americans to launch um, an invasion and scholars now think that one of the ways that he did this was by pieces of kind of disinformation mm-hmm. like the Joe Demarche that would lead the Americans to say okay well maybe maybe there is a chance for engagement here um, and and you know, and, and maybe not launch an invasion, or or just you know, and also um, just to glean intelligence from during these talks to try to get a sense of what the U.S. was going to do during this period. And I think that was successful in some ways for him. Yeah, when I when I was working on China in 1945, I actually changed my uh, my initial assumption. My assumption, having been brought up with this idea that somehow bad relations between the United States and China were sort of like parallel to bad relations between the United States and Ho Chi Minh. You remember that Ho Chi Minh uh, in the 40s uh, during World War II and then even after World War II uh, when he began the fight against the French, uh, reached out to the United States on several occasions, wrote letters to Truman uh, offering the hand of friendship uh, and uh, those letters were never, never replied to. I've always felt that in, in Ho Chi Minh's case, if we had paid attention to that and we had modified our policy in that instance, we actually could have established a relationship with the Vietnamese, especially because the, the Vietnamese traditional enemy was China, and we made a big mistake to think that because they were both communists that they were going to be perpetually on the same side. But I've always felt that in the case, and, and, and so I thought along those same lines with Mao, that Barbara Tuckman article, um, the uh, the position of the China hands, uh, uh, John uh, service, s- and, service Davies. and Davies and all that, uh, that we could wean Mao from the Soviet Union. And as I looked into it, I came to the conclusion that no, uh, uh, they were wrong. Much as I admired Davies and service and the China hands, on that on that point, uh, they were wrong. Yeah, I agree with that, and I think um, I, and I, and I think if there ever was that chance, it was long gone by the period I'm writing about. Because you've got to remember, this period is after there have been a series of missions over the course of, um, you know, 1945, 1946, to mediate, to come to some kind of agreement. And, um, you know, the, you know the, the, Hurley, the Hurley mediation efforts and the, and the, um, the, Marshall, the Marshall mission, uh, 1946. And so by this time, I mean, Mao's fed up. Mao, Mao feels like that the U.S. is playing um, a bit of a double game with him, that they're trying to mediate a, um, uh, some kind of a coalition government while still supporting the nationalists, um, giving them political cover and militarily. Um, and he had a point. And Atchison, you know, in later years, I think Atchison and has said, you know, has said that very thing that we're, that I and everybody else was wrong that we thought that, you know, that this was going to bear fruit and it just mm-hmm. didn't. So. Yeah, Davies also uh, made some comments about that that they underestimated the uh, degree to which Mao was an ideological figure. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's the question about recognition, uh, and as you you write, you you describe how the Brits went ahead and did establish uh, diplomatic relations with China and the Truman administration and uh, Atchison saw that as a betrayal. Uh, How how, was it ever possible at all 
uh, at that time that the United States might have moved to establish diplomatic relations. Again, whether it would have made a big difference in the nature of the relationship or not. Uh, uh, but was there a possibility? I mean, how strong well, was sure. the argument? I think. I mean, they could. I mean, I don't think there's any reason mm -hmm. um, the U.S. <laughs> couldn't have done just what what the Brits did in, in mm -hmm. 1950. But there were a lot of countervailing factors that um, that that I think are worth considering. And one of them is um, that Truman didn't want to. I mean, Truman. You know, Truman's mm -hmm. a pretty important player, and Truman Truman just wasn't. You know, he was less pragmatic than Acheson in a lot of ways. I think Acheson probably, you know, Acheson was an Anglophile and he, you know, I think if you, if you left Acheson to his own devices, he might have done that. He might have followed the British lead, and, you know, in that and, and, um, and done it. But, um, but Truman was really, um, in a lot of ways, kind of a, he was more passionate than Acheson, more of a gut player in some ways. I mean, obviously, you know, Truman and President Trump are nothing alike policy wise you know i mean you know truman's mm -hmm. the ultimate internationalist and trump you know trump is the america first nationalist um so they're you know nothing nothing alike whatsoever but temperamentally when you read you know you read about truman um uh, during this period there's a little of that there's a little of that you know kind of you know urge to send in the marines and get things done and um and there's a a, a a a line that atchison had that i liked he said um, Atchison sometimes thought of Truman as being like a little boy who you tell not to stick peanuts up his nose, and the minute you turn around, there he is sticking peanuts up his nose. And I, you know, I don't know why that reminds me of the newspapers today. But um, so, so Truman was a major factor in, um, I, I think, in uh, one factor in why the U.S. didn't. Um, you know, American public opinion was running pretty strongly against it, and you have to remember what else is going on during the course of this year. I mean, the the um, Russians exploded their first atomic bomb in mm -hmm. late August or early September. Um, there is in the in the newspapers there are um, a, a series of high-profile spy trials. The Alger Hiss trial is going on in the summer of 1949. There are a number of other ones. And there was I saw one statistic that. Um, during over the, the first half of 1949, 32% of all front page newspaper stories during that year were about the spy theme or something closely related to it. So, you know, in American public opinion, there's these fears of spying, fears of, uh, uh, you know, Soviet atomic ambitions. And, mm -hmm. and, and Eastern uh, Europe, I mean, had been... Right, uh, right, and, and the, the Cold Russians. War, you know, we're now, we're, we're now, you yeah. know, uh, okay, well now into what, the early Cold War. So I think, you know, so I think there was that too. Okay, what about Mao? Uh, I mean, again, one of the things that I felt about this debate is that it always focused on on the United States and what we decided, and it almost treats Mao uh, as a figure without agency, without his, you know, without uh, choices that he himself uh, made, which is nonsense when it comes to Mao, one of the great protean figures of the 20th century. Uh, whether you like him or not, he was certainly that. Um, what about him? What was it about him that uh, prevented the United States and China from establishing at least a kind of working relationship? Well, I think, I, you know, I, I think Mao probably would have welcomed diplomatic recognition if, if the U.S. had mm -hmm. offered it. And in fact, he sometimes, you know, when things were going badly in his negotiations with Stalin, he would sometimes, he would send telegrams back, especially during the early days of kind of the, the talks about the Sino-Soviet Treaty when he was in Moscow and things, you know, Stalin wouldn't see him. He would kind of send telegrams home that say, well, maybe we should talk to the Americans. You know, he would kind of, you know, play them off each other um, a little bit. But the truth is, I mean, uh, you know, Mao had a giant problem. He had a giant task. And you mentioned the, you know, the, the singing the arias. There's this kind of this double nature to Mao during this period. I mean, he's on the one hand, you know, about to achieve his lifelong ambition, and he's over, you know, he's in Shibaipo, kind of on the outskirts of Beijing, and he's, you know, he's getting news of these battles that he's winning day after day, and you know, singing along with the, with the operas, kind of full of confidence and optimism during that period. That's one Mao, and that's a that's a real Mao. The other Mao is is deeply insecure at this at this point because um, he absolutely needs Stalin's help to rebuild. He needs help. He needs economic help to rebuild China in the aftermath of the Civil War. And the, I mean, the the figures are, are are staggering when you look. I mean, it's like 80 to 100 million refugees and 15 million dead, and China's um, uh, industrial output had fallen by half over the course of the decade. You know, between the you know 1935 and the end of the of World War II. So he just has this enormous task um, of rebuilding, um, and he needs help. And and Stalin was willing to give it, and and so he 
um, he needed help with a couple of things. He needed money. He needed loans, low interest loans um, that um, uh, you know th that he could use to help rebuild China. He also needed advisors and weaponry. I mean, one of one of Mao's after he t he takes uh, Beijing, Nanjing, Shanghai, his next objective, which he hopes he can do within the year. And by the way, which the CIA thought that he could do within the year is to take Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But his navy was terrible, you know. So um, and his air force was terrible. I mean, it was, it was nothing to speak of. I think so at this point. So um, he um, uh, Stalin sent uh, in the middle of 1949. Um, aviation advisors, pilots, people to open um, schools in uh, aviation schools and naval schools in China during um, during this period. Um, so he really, you know, he, he he really needed Stalin's help in a way. And I don't think, you know, by this time, you know, because of all the reasons we we're just talking about, he knows he's not going to get the same level of help um, mm -hmm. from from the Americans. Yeah. But is it that, or I mean, is there an ideological component here? You don't you don't talk much about Mao, Mao's ideology. Uh, you talk about him as you just just now more as a kind of a pragmatic figure. He needed help. Uh, Stalin was willing to give it. He felt the hostility of the United States. Uh, I mean, objectively speaking, uh, the United States actually, if it had wanted to, could have given a lot more help uh, than uh, the Soviet Union uh, if did. If it wanted to. If it had wanted yeah. to. I mean, it did want to uh, 25 or 30 years later, and we're in a way paying a price for that, too. I mean, we've uh, we've helped China a lot uh, to become the dynamic economy. Uh, that it is, uh, maybe that could have happened uh, if the players had been a little different, if the atmospherics had been a little bit different, that might have happened uh, uh, much earlier. Except, I'm not sure that Mao, as a a, a revolutionary internationalist, uh, as a as a figure imbued with the notion of the of the global and world revolution, would have accepted it, even if the United States had been in a position to offer it. Yeah. I wonder, you know, whether you think that the idea that his ideological position, uh, you know, ideas count. Yep. Uh, Actually, I agree totally yeah. with that. I mean, I, I think it was both. I think it was. Mm -hmm. I think it was pragmatism for all the op obvious reasons when you you know that we were just talked about and you look at it. But I thought I think he he was also ideologically committed, as you uh, as you say. I mean, he um, he was. He wrote a lot about it. He was. I mean, we, we know that it's something that we we kind of know about Mao, and I think um, mm -hmm. and I think that was certainly part of it also. Right. But that also is part of this um, really very widespread. Uh, I mean, in a way, it's too bad we don't have somebody here. Maybe there is somebody here who who, uh, who agrees with the, the proposition that if we had played our cards differently, the outcome would have been very substantially uh, different. But you know, certainly one of the uh, one of the arguments there uh, it, it has has minimized Mao as a uh, as a revolutionary, has emphasized his. Pragmatic. I mean, he was both a pragmatic. You see it less today. Idea. You see it less today in the scholarship. Yeah. You see it more in that during that period in the yeah. kind of the early '80s when people were were making that that argument. You know, as I say, after the opening to China. Right. But and I mean, maybe, and I, I just from everything we know from the you know from the sources now after the end of the Cold War, um, I think that pic the picture that you describe and that I that I kind of agree mm -hmm. with is is more yeah. and more the kind of. Accepted one. So I'm sort of beating a dead horse here. Uh, well, I don't know. Probably, there probably are people who disagree <laughs> with us in the audience. Uh, um, I mean, one of the other factors is the current situation. Uh, I mean, here in a way, we did then do 25 years later uh, what uh, John Patton Davies and John Stewart Service were telling us to do uh, back in even during the war, which is to engage uh, with China to establish a relationship, to accept uh, that uh, the communists are going to rule China and to make whatever deals uh, we can with it. Uh, and you know that hasn't worked out brilliantly either. Now we find uh, uh, China as a great power uh, is trying to reduce the American role in East Asia to replace the United States as the, as the dominant power in, in its part of the world. I don't know whether you have any thoughts about uh, you know, whether that might have happened much earlier had we been able to pursue a different policy. Yeah, I mean, I, well, we've talked about a little bit about this already, but I mean, I, I do think there. I mean, I think there is some contemporary relevance in this debate because you know this this debate over um, containing or engaging um, is you know I mean it's it's something it, it sounds familiar because we're still debating it seventy years later, and you know certainly within the Trump administration, this debate is going on of, of, of whether sort of this. 
this vision of, of China as, um, you know, this, this vision of engagement and this vision of China as, as even kind of a force for stability in the region, um, whether, you know, there's some questioning of whether, the, whether that's worked, as you said, and whether that the U.S. needs to do more to balance China in the region by bolstering some of the regional players um, economically or, or politically or diplomatically. Um, that's a debate that's been going on for a long time. Um, I think if there's, if there's a lesson, you know, from the period that I'm writing about for that current debate, and I think there's a lot of things, you know, I don't want to be too glib about it because the times are, compl- you know, we're talking about a distance of 70 years. We're talking about a China, you know, before the, you know, the runaway economic growth of the 1990s. And mm-hmm. so there's a lot that's an awful, awful lot different. But I think if there's one thing that we can learn about this period, it's that it, it's sort of not to wedge yourself too closely to these these paradigms, these international relations paradigms, because in 1949, neither of them really worked. I mean, you look at somebody like like um, Stewart, the ambassador to, to Nanjing. He wanted to engage with Mao. Um, you know, he, he held these talks. They they came to nothing. That Stewart eventually um, had a stroke in a train bathroom at the end of 1949. I mean, he had really seen his his sort of lifelong ambition of of you know cultivating a, a friendly China, and he, he, he saw it dashed in 1949. That didn't really work, as we know, and there weren't, these ties didn't develop until three decades later. Um, the, you know, the containment crowd, I happen to think, you know, if I were, you know, you sometimes think about what would you do if you were sitting in Dean Acheson's chair during this year, Truman's chair, and I happen to think that, that he did about as well as he could have during 1949, um, and, you know, containment vis-a-vis the Soviet Union was a pretty effective policy over the years. But, I, I mean, there were some real serious um, consequences to that, um, to that. And, you know, we've talked about them in Vietnam, the buildup in Southeast Asia, um, in the Korean War, the, you know, the sort of the logic of containment that was established during this year that I'm writing about um, is, you know, conditioned the American response to Kim Il-sung's invasion. So, I mean, what I tried to do is, you know, I, I think a lot of times we try to ask these, like, these kind of if questions. If we had recognized, um, you know, um, uh, Mao's new government like the British have, would things have turned out differently? And if, you know, if we had poured resources into the nationalist, uh, you know, into the nationalist forces and somehow reformed um, Chiang Kai-shek's military, would things have turned out differently on the mainland? And I, one of the things I'm trying to get it across in the book is I don't... I, I, I don't think that that's a. I don't think international affairs really works like that. I think you know professors trying to get tenure who make you know you know try have theses like that. It works for that. But in international affairs, really, I think you're just you know if you're Dean Acheson, you're just making choices and dealing with the consequences. And I think you know I, one of the kind of the main themes of the book is that sometimes even good choices have bad consequences. And I think it's it's something that mm. um, these guys had to deal with um, year over year. And you you know you put yourself you look at I mean one of the things you can do now is you can all the um, the minutes from Acheson's morning meetings are, are now available at the National Archives. He called them. It was a nine thirty meeting in the morning. He called it the prayer meeting. And so you can get a sense of what they're talking about. And they'll, they'll talk about what they're reading and what they're seeing and the intelligence reports that they're getting, the CIA reports that you're getting. And you put yourself in their shoes and you, and you try to see, you know, what they're seeing. And, you know, from the distance of 30 years, you know, or for, you know, 70 years now, um, you want to say, well, you know, why were you why were you sending you know advisors to Southeast Asia that, during this period? Why were you backing the French during this period in South? But you know, when you see what they're seeing, you're seeing you know the CIA is telling them Mao's about to invade uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah. You're, you know, they're seeing they're 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 um, you know they're, they have to deal with they need the the support of the French in Europe dealing you know with NATO and some of this, so they don't want to alienate the French. There's just a lot of factors, and the truth is these are you know the really hard choices that they had to make during mm-hmm. this period. What surprised you in doing the research? What what, Surpri- was, what was unexpected to you? Well, I mean, I I loved. <laughs> reading through these, you know, the CIA diet is the one thing that I hadn't seen a lot of. And, you know, I'll just give you an example. I mean, basically what happened is in the middle of 1949, the Office of Policy Coordination, which was the covert action arm of the the early American intelligence apparatus, sent a team of operatives to Hong Kong. And basically what they did is they shuttled back and forth from Hong Kong to the mainland and um, 
trying to establish what they called a belt of resistance on the mainland, kind of around the periphery of the territory um, that Mao controlled. And um, it's, you know, they're literally, you know, they're flying back and forth on these C-46s that, you know, they look like these big footballs, and they're carrying baskets of Hong Kong dollars that they had, they'd exchanged kind of secretly on the Hong Kong markets, and just, and you know, literally driving in Jeeps and handing them off to these provincial leaders. And, um, I mean, it makes, it, it, it just makes for some, some great reading. And um, it's, the, also, dur during this period, the, the CIA's first, the first casualty ever in CIA history took place during this period. Um, his name was Douglas McKiernan. And oh, right. he was mm -hmm. um, he was based um, in uh, in northwest China at the kind of under diplomatic cover in the consulate there. And as as Mao's forces kind of swept west and, and took over western China, he decides um, that he has to flee. And he he kind of you know it's it's like something out of a movie. He straps gold bars like the size of sugar cubes to his body and he fills this jeep with uh, with uh, grenades and ammunition and he's got these these things called um, one-time pads which were kind of a primitive means of communication that you know you could send a message um, one time and and he sets off across the desert and he is going to regroup in Tibet um, and so he kind of sets off um, during in the fall of 1949 and the, um, the tragedy of this story is he gets, he had, it's like 1,500 miles um, through the desert, and he's you know, on jeeps and horses and all these kind of things. He gets to the border of Tibet, and a Tibetan border guard doesn't realize who he is and shoots and kills him right at the border. So mm -hmm. I always feel terrible for Douglas McKernan. But first casualty mm -hmm. of the CIA um, mm -hmm. during this period. And, yeah. um, and you get a sense, I mean, I think this comes across in your book too, that this is, this is very early days of... Um, of American intelligence operations, and so there's all these kind of overlapping, like you know, McKiernan was um, was CIA. These other guys are report to Frank Wisner, who's you know OPC. There's all these kind of different and overlapping kind of intelligence operators running around um, in China. Yeah, as they were during the during the war as well. Yeah. Um, but they, I mean, one of the things that's striking is that the CIA doesn't seem to have known much what it was doing. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem to have gotten it right. I was wondering when you know you read through all these new uh, CIA documents. Did you did you come across some shrewd analysis of China? No, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean and these uh, were mostly they were feudal operations. I mean, they were they were very <laughs> short lived, at least on the mainland. I mean, they you know they sent they, they sent these guys over. It's basically you know they're 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 the result of turf battles between um, you know within the government. Um, uh, Claire Chenault, the gen, you know, uh, is 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 pushing very hard for these. He's kind of leading in, in a sense um, these operations in some ways. Um, there are others like um, George Kennan, the director of policy planning um, at, at the State Department, um, who really doesn't. He actually has to approve them, but he doesn't think they're going to make you know a, mm -hmm. a whit of difference. So a lot of it's you know it's like bureaucratic. Uh, you know, puppet show. It's that, you know, Kennan sort of knows it's not going to work, but he's getting a lot of pressure to do it, so he approves it. And um, so, no, I mean, none of them were particularly um, impressive, uh, impressive operations during this period. And most of it, most of these efforts completely collapsed by the end of, uh, yeah. of 1949. And it's sort of a, there's a kind of mirror imaging here. On the one hand, we're, the, the CIA and these other intelligence agencies are needling the Chinese or, or harassing them on the periphery and uh, feeding this idea of American hostility, uh, which certainly diminished any chances that we could establish a working relationship with China. But the Chinese are also doing stuff like that. I mean, you talk a lot about the Ward case, the uh, American consul in Shenyang who was uh, uh, basically locked up for a year in the consulate. Uh, and uh, you described very graphically uh, Truman's fury uh, in 1949 when uh, Ward and the others in the uh, consulate are uh, put on trial and convicted. And, uh, that was yeah. one of those examples of Truman. So, you know, Truman wants to, these guys, this diplomat has been imprisoned, and Truman, you know, his first instinct is to send in the, the Marines to get him out, which is, you know, it's directly opposed to, you know, the more reasoned thinking of the State Department during this period, who the last thing they want to do is, you know, is a, a kind of a military operation of yeah. that, that scale. And but I, I thought a little bit about the, um, uh, about the um, Iran hostage crisis, that there was a certain kind of <clears throat> foreshadowing, in a way, uh, you know, that the, uh, the Mao's regime took over this a consulate, which is, you know, you're not supposed to do, uh, and uh, provoked uh, a lot of anger 
on the American side. I mean, you explain it, uh, you, you, you interpret that as a message that he was trying to send to Stalin. That's one possibility uh, yeah. that he was trying to do. Yeah. So, um, anyway. Yeah, and it was a long period. I mean, they were, they were, um, they were held um, incommunicado for um, a year, yeah. um, essentially, before... In very um, miserable conditions. Before they, they were released. Um, one other interesting element about the kind of the spy game aspect, I mean, we were talking a lot about American spying in, um, uh, in China. There was also spying going on, you know, in the U.S., obviously, during this period. And one of the, the, the interesting things to think about is... Um, Guy Burgess, you know Guy Burgess, the, one of the, sure. the Cambridge mm-hmm. spy ring with Kim Philby and mm-hmm. um, another British spy um, uh, uh, for the Soviets during this period. He was on the, um, the East Asia desk of the British Foreign Office during this period. So one of the things that kind of historians wonder about, and there's, not, you know, there's no real smoking gun or evidence to, to, to say that he was, but I mean, he had access to these, the, the conversations that were going on in the fall of 1949 between the Brits and the U.S., it's certainly, it's certainly possible and plausible that he could have passed information about, that Stalin could have had, and, and possibly even Mao had, information about what the British and the U.S. were talking mm-hmm. about as they were trying to, mm-hmm. to formulate a response. And, and, um, and, and Mao and Joe and Lai in particular were, were very conscious of the fact that British interests and uh, American interests during this period weren't exactly the same. I mean, they were the um, the British uh, American economic interest in China during this period. It was something like you know 100 or 200 million dollars worth of um, worth of investments in China. Relatively small. Um, Britain's was was four or five times that. So they had a much a much bigger uh, and uh, more long-standing tradition of um, uh, of doing business with China. And also they had Hong Kong that they were worried about. So the the, the interests of the U.S. and Britain weren't exactly identical. And um, I, I think it's interesting to think that that. Mao and his and his cohorts were conscious of this and, and trying to you know and aware of it and interested in kind of playing up these contradictions. Mm-hmm. So um, I've had a chance to ask my questions. Uh, let's uh, throw it open to others. Yeah. Uh, I'm Bill Armbruster, retired journalist. A um, couple of questions, all related to that Mao trip to Moscow. When exactly was it? How long did he stay? And were his telegrams back to Beijing being read by the Soviets? Um, yeah, great questions. Um, they were. It's, he went in um, in early December 1949. He left during this period. There were a couple of aborted trips um, uh, leading up to that period where he had Mao. At, at one point, Stalin had invited him. Uh, invited Mao, or Mao had invited himself the year before. Mao went so far as to have a coat tailored um, for the for the journey, and then Stalin disinvited him. Mao was very upset about this, but Stalin was very good at um, keeping even you know sometime allies off balance and doing the, playing these kind of power games. So um, so Mao wanted to go to to Moscow. Stalin kept him from doing. Would kind of use the excuse of you know you've got to f- you know finish what you're doing at home, and then when you do, we c- um, you can visit. But um, he did finally um, approve the visit, and Mao left um, by train in um, a- in December of uh, 1949. And one of the interesting kind of images I have of this is there's a as the train is rolling through Manchuria um, during the first leg of the visit, Mao sees pictures of Stalin hanging, and he and he gets very upset about that. You know, nothing kind of irritated Mao during this period is seeing you know um, you know images of Stalin or thinking that you know Stalin is. is it, it, it somehow has a higher profile than him, um, and um, so anyway, so he gets to Moscow. Um, the the talks lasted um, uh, a couple of months. He was there for a couple of months. He did some tourism, um, and um, uh, during this period, and Stalin again played these kind of um, these power games with Mao. He would he would invite. He met him on the first day he arrived, um, and um, you know met him in his office at the Kremlin, and they had a quick talk. And then he didn't see him for I think it was a period of weeks. He just he just kind of put him on ice for a while and sent him to this Dhaka in um, uh, in uh, outside of Moscow. And, and Mao just kind of stewed and 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 he just kind of let him stew. And I think that you know that was kind of Stalin's mo. Uh, Mao was very upset um, during this period, and and this is he he did send these telegrams back, and he did them. Um, certainly, Stalin was reading them, um, and um, uh, and Mao knew it, and so he would use this as 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 a way to. I mean, presumably, I don't, I, you know, I'm, you know, I, knowing they're reading, he would use them as a, a way of 
um, communicating, you know, with Stalin by kind of, you know, teasing him. Um, I'll give you another, one more example of Telegram. It's not related to Mao, but it's, it's interesting, I think. Um, during this period, we haven't talked um, much about um, um, Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Madame Chiang Kai-shek spent the entire year of 1949 um, in the United States lobbying for a kind of last-ditch um, American aid effort. And it was sort of a lost cause, but um, she sent telegrams, um, dozens of telegrams back and forth to Chiang Kai-shek um, during this period. And there's no, you know, for somebody who's writing history, there's no greater gift than when a husband and wife are apart during the period you're writing about because they're, you know, they're sending these, they're almost like, you know, emails. They remind me of my emails with my wife of, of kind of, you know, saying, you know, she's saying, you know, give the, give the speech and he's saying, I don't want to give the speech and, you know, and they're kind of, um, but these are now in a, they're a, a good source um, for my book um, and they're now in an archive in Taipei and um, uh, you can get them and there's, you know, what we know, a lot of what we know about um, the nationalist lobbying operation during 1949 comes, some of it comes from these telegrams. Because in the telegram, she'll say, you know, can you send $200,000, you know, I, so-and-so congressman is, is going to give a speech of support and, you know, we want to establish a propaganda organization and, and he'll write back, you know, don't, don't put this in telegram, don't put the names of congressmen in telegrams, please, but it makes for a really colorful reading. And those were also, the, the reason I, I brought that up is those were also, th those were read by the CIA. And now you can go to the Truman Library and look through these and you see, you know, you see the, the Washington is reading their correspondence. So everybody's reading everybody's mail. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Jeff, do you have a question and an observation at the same time. We Americans ran a war in, uh, in Asia against the Japanese and that uh, were deeply involved in, in the China mainland, General Stilwell and that whole story. And uh, after the war, we had a big intelligence operation there. Were we snookered? Uh, were we open to being snookered? Or did we, did we create the conditions for Mao and Stalin to, to basically manipulate our our view of the way things were going on so that we would make major mistakes or are our failures are of our own making? That's an interesting question. I don't, I mean, that was certainly the debate that was going on during 1949. Um, and one of the, the characters that we haven't talked about but who makes some of these arguments is Walter Judd, who's Walter Judd mm -hmm. is a congressman, Republican congressman um, from Minnesota. Um, and he's really... Um, he makes the argument that um, that you know the U.S. you know poured investments into Chiang Kai-shek's government during um, during World War II, some you know three and a half billion dollars, lend-lease aid, supplies, um, and um, he was you know he he felt like the war had been won, so why are we letting now Stalin you know maneuver for advantage in China? Um, and that was the argument that he made over and over uh, over the course of that year. By the way, Democrats made that argument too. John F. Kennedy, who was a young congressman, he was 31, um, made that argument um, on you know during his stump speeches um, during that year. And um, Judd, Judd was a really interesting character, and the reason I included him in the book is because although he was a Republican, his view and Truman's in some way were similar. They, 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 both, um, they, they both really wanted to kind of, you know, at, at, um, you know at, at base, they wanted to kind of heal China and repair China and, and for China to be, to kind of fulfill the FDR's uh, old dream of, of being one of the four policemen in the world in cooperation. Judd was very much about that. He didn't want this aid to go to waste. Um, and one of the reasons I liked him as a character and a kind of a foil to Acheson it goes back to this point I was making about the story and the choices and the trade-offs. For Truman, the process of going through this year, in siding with Acheson, Truman kind of, he betrayed Judd, who was an old friend of his, and he betrayed kind of this vision of the world that he had once had of, of, of China as a major pillar of post-war um, security. So I, it's just all a long way of saying that this, the debate was going on um, during, this, uh, during this period with some of, these, some of the players at the time. And another, an, another um, uh, person that I think is interested, had an interesting comment on, on the same subject is Walter Lippmann. And you go through one of the kind of pleasures of 
um, going through the archives of this period is coming across Walter Lippmann's columns and reading them. And they're so, you know, you wish as a journalist you could be that prescient is to read his columns that were written in the 40s. But what he said basically is, he said, you know, the argument of, of Acheson was basically there's nothing that we could do to prevent Mao from taking over um, the China. And Lippmann basically agrees with this. And he says, you know, Truman and Acheson are entitled to say that there's nothing that Washington could have done to prevent Mao from taking it over. But what they're not entitled to say is that we couldn't, we had no control over our own actions during this period. And kind of asking the question, raising some of these questions mm -hmm. of why, why, if that was the case, you know, did, did so much lend lease aid end up going there? Why, you know, why did the U.S. do some of the things that it did um, during World War II? So I think it's a, you know, it's an unanswerable question, but a good one. But, you know, you talk about the Japanese. If I could just, just one quick comment. Uh, um, I mean, the, the underlying uh, fault, if you want to call it that, uh, the triggering event, of course, was Japan's invasion of China. And you imagine the uh, incredible, colossal irony here that the United States has expended uh, tremendous resources uh, in order to defeat the Japanese, in order to save China, in order to preserve a China that will be one of the four pillars, one of the four policemen to save China that will conform or correspond to Roosevelt's vision. And then result of it is that we lose China to, uh, to communism and for that period of the Cold War to the Soviet Union. Um, so, I mean, one of the great historical ifs would be, uh, what if we had decided, I mean, up until the, up until the uh, as we all know, we didn't get involved in the war until Pearl Harbor. Uh, if the Japanese had simply conquered China, and not attack us at Pearl Harbor, how, how would history have been different and what would uh, China and the United States be like now? Yes, back there. Uh, hi, I'm Tristan Chapman. I'm a student, uh, I'm a candidate for Masters of International Relations at NYU. Um, you talked a little about Zhou Enlai and the community uh, suggesting there were tensions between Mao and Zhou Enlai and the division of the Communist Party. Do we have a lot of information on, how's uh, on how Mao's relationship with the Communist Party affected his decision making during this period, and um, what kind of support he had within the Communist Party at that point of China? It's an excellent question. I mean, from everything, and, and a difficult one to answer because of the nature of the Chinese sources that are available, I think. I mean, I, I think everything that we have, and to, you know, I would, I would be interesting to hear your perspective on this too, having done you know, research in, this, in similar materials, but everything that we have seems to show that, that Mao was pretty much you know, dominated the decision-making process. Um, and he, you know, a lot of the statements that came out from the Central Committee were written by Mao. Um, he's, you know, he's making very, you know, uh, according to the documents that we have, very, you know, he's directing battles and he's directing mm -hmm. policy um, during this, during at least this period that I'm writing about. Um, uh, there are obviously limits to what we know about those documents because they've been they've been edited. The documents that are available have been edited by Chinese scholars under the you know the umbrella of um, you know the current um, system of government, and um, so you know we all you know we know what happens sometimes. So we tend to want to put Mao, you know have Mao making all the decisions and controlling everything and being the great hero of the um, the thing. So I think and our and, and, and our basic I mean the basic sense about these documents that are available which are now available in kind of chronologies and anthologies of telegrams that he had sent is that they're they're genuine documents but maybe edited um, not not edited um, within themselves but select you know selectively kind of cherry picked that paint a picture. Uh, so that's, that's my impression. My impression is that he was, he was pretty much in control of the policy making process, but with the caveat that don't know for sure because of the, you know, the reasons I was talking about. What do you think about that? No, I, I agree. I mean, I think uh, the war itself uh, enhanced Mao's authority and prestige within the, China, within the Communist Party. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the things that happened during the war was the uh, rectification campaign of 1942 kind of precursor of the Cultural Revolution, uh, where Mao essentially eliminated any possibility of opposition to him. Uh, and, you know, the, the war itself and his leadership of the communist movement uh, as a consequence it didn't create his kind of demigod status. He already had that, uh, or he was already working toward that, but it, but it sort of finished it off. It completed uh, his, his uh, unassailable status. Uh, and um, there, there was no disagreement. And I, I, I mean, of course, like you say, I mean, we, we don't know for sure because we're not 
there. We don't have the documents, but uh, there's certainly no sign of any serious disagreement, certainly not on Joe and Lai's part. Ma'am, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I'm coming. Uh, Joyce Mitchell, and I work. Is this on? Yeah. Yes. Okay. No. And I, I spend about six or seven months a year in China since 2008. And I work with um, 30 and 40 year old Chinese. Um, and I've. I'm looking at the same history you are from Deng Xiaoping's um, biography, from the uh, Long March on. And um, if I just look, listen to the Chinese, I wouldn't even know that America dropped the atomic bomb in, uh, in Japan. And I would have thought that it was the Long March and Mao that did all the fighting. But it turns out, it seems to be that uh, Chiang Kai-shek did all the fighting and and beat back Japan. And so um, when you're looking just at Mao, uh, it, it doesn't seem that that's the whole story, seeing that Zhou Enlai and um, Shopping were with him from the 30s on. Um, do forever with those guys. Yeah, I mean, I think we've addressed some of those some of those points. That kind, I mean, the, the, you know, the best information that we have is that that Mao really was in control during that period. But you do raise an interesting question about, I think, the the nature of historical memory in China as it is now about this period. And you know, as we all know, kind of nostalgia for the past and um, for you know the real or imagined kind of you know, triumphs of, of, of the nation's history are, that's a tool of, of nationalism, of modern day nationalism. And if you're Xi Jinping, you don't look, I mean, you, you can't look to the Cultural Revolution or the Great Leap Forward when you're, when you're trying to stoke nationalism in, in China today, you look to something like 1949, where, where you know, it was a great triumph for, for Mao and for the party. So it is interesting to see today when you go to, you know, like I'll, I'll give you an example. I went to, um, to um, Xi Bai Po for um, out, mm. you know, as we were, I, I mentioned, I think was Mao's um, one of Mao's last base camps before he came into the city. And you can go there, and you can see it's a tourist site now, and you can see, um, you know, for for a couple of bucks, you can sit in Mao's a replica of Mao's canvas folding chair, or you can pose with a rifle behind um, sandbags, wearing an army uniform. And um, so there's a restaurant there called Red Memory. Um, you know, so these are all, you know, the, you know, the, in in real ways, um, the past. Is is present there, and this the control over you know the, this whole question of you know control over the past and who's you know the the memory of the past is a really interesting one. It's even more interesting on um, in Taiwan right now. I find um, mm. with um, you know I was in Taiwan in in March and um, so interesting now because you know we think on the one hand this the period that I'm writing about in in 1949 it's the birth of the Taiwan you know the Taipei Be Beijing antagonism Chiang Kai Shek flees to, um, to, to um, Taipei at the end of the year. And, but on the other hand, the politics are completely different right now because with, with um, you know, the Kuomintang not in power anymore, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the presidency. And so, um, you know, there's an interesting dynamic there, too, with the historical memory and who's, you know, revision of the textbooks um, that's going on right now. It's, really, it's a really yeah. interesting question. Yeah, I've been to Taiwan in recent times also. I mean, the, and the, the mainlanders, I mean, the, the Chinese communists have now embraced Chiang Kai-shek yep. and rehabilitated him. Why? Because he was a one China person. Uh, I mean, he, he was an enemy of Mao, but he was uh, he was a one China. I mean, never questioned the idea of one China, whereas the current government in Taiwan does question the. the I mean, they have a, the, their idea is yes, there's one China and there's also one Taiwan, uh, which of course is very objectionable in Beijing. And one of the great uh, myths that have been promoted uh, very successfully by the Chinese communists is that they won World War II against the Japanese. Of course, that's. That's ridiculous in two ways. First of all, it was the Americans that won World War II against the Japanese, and uh, they, uh, and secondly, even in China, the nationalists, as you as you pointed out, did the the brunt of the fighting. I mean, the communists were able to enormously expand uh, the territory that they controlled and the number and their troops and build up their army. And one of the reasons that they were able to do that is because they weren't fighting very much, while the nationalists were were their armies were being decimated. And when at the end of the war.
uh, when it came to the confrontation between the communists and the nationalists, the nationalists were a much weaker force because they had been fighting the Japanese and the, and the communists really basically hadn't. So, <clears throat> one more question. Yeah. My name is Sue. Uh, as I uh, understood, um, by 48, 49, uh, late 48, actually U.S. government and Stalin both were still favoring Chiang Kai-shek because Stalin actually made statement saying that uh, he believed Chiang Kai-shek was the, the one um, who had the intelligence or who had the ability to uh, rule China or lead China. Um, so in your research, was there any documents or any traces um, showing that why we decided, the U.S. government decided still go with Chiang Kai-shek even they saw very clearly that Chiang Kai-shek was a losing, uh, you know, even with Madam Chiang Kai-shek here, uh, you know, giving lectures and, you know, trying to get the uh, Congress to support China. Uh, why we decided not to dump Chiang Kai-shek at the time? Was there any traces in that document that shows that? Uh, and also during, um, let's say, 50s, 60s, um, I grew up in China, uh, the one major document against the U.S. was Mao's uh, article on, uh, uh, called the Farewell uh, Stewart. Uh, that was totally anti-American. So, um, you know, uh, that was in 49. So did we, did the U.S. government do anything at that time to um, decide, okay, because of that, that we support Chiang Kai-shek, or actually we did something wrong that we're going to... Is there any trace uh, in doing your research? It's not the why or what w should we do, but was there anything indicating that we did something? Yeah, um, that, uh, those two questions are related, actually, because they, you know, they, they, they're in the same period, and um, I think... Um, I think the biggest thing was inertia. I think that you know this the the it was inertia and it was politic the American domestic politics that the U.S. had been supporting um, Chiang's government through the war you know um, through the war and after the war and there was a lot of we talked a little bit about the the political pressure on Truman to continue the support um, and there was a sense even even people who you know Truman by 1947 was calling um, this aid um, to Chiang Kai-shek to the nationalist government I mean like pouring sand down a rat hole so Truman had soured uh, soured on Chiang by by you know 47 something like yeah. that, even earlier maybe um, um, even even in your period you know um, um, and um, so so Truman had had you know no love for the nationalists really and but it was it was partly inertia and partly a sense of Mao hadn't yet taken over um, you know hadn't until this period um, of the beginning of 1949 really the end of 1948 he started Mao started winning um, these um, these enormous battles against Chiang and and, um, and and then Mao took the cities in the beginning of 1949 it was at that point that you know any any time before that Truman and uh, and, um, and Marshall, who was the Secretary of State before Atchison, felt like basically, you know, throwing Chung under the bus would just be, you know, he hadn't lost yet. So the, you know, he was he he was the, you know, Truman at one point said we bet on the wrong horse, but he was he was still still the horse at that point. Um, after you know about February 1949, Atchison comes to the decision um, with Truman that. It's time to throw Chung under the bus, and really, and and the way he did that um, partly was by publishing a thousand-page document, which was a lot of it was the kind of you know the the mid twentieth century WikiLeaks. It was kind of cables, thousands of pages of of cables showing um, you know intended to show the nationalist government's flaws and that, how much effort the U.S. had had put into supporting the regime. And um, and you know why it hadn't worked out, and he saw that as you know they decided the time had come to do this to to sacrifice Chung, publish this enormous paper in I think August of 1949 publicly, and this document um, spurred the article that you're referring to, the farewell Leighton Stewart um, on the the part of Mao, um, and Mao saw it as um, he he read these documents and said. Um, well, look at, you know, he, he said it's an example of how much effort the U.S. has uh, poured into Chiang's regime over the years and how much support they had for him, um, and, and that's why he released this article. So, right. um, even, though they ha even though the white paper, you're talking about the white yeah, paper, yeah. 
makes the argument that the, that the Chinese people had by then already rejected Chiang Kai-shek, and yet the United States continues to support him. Right. Now it was right. Right. But the goal was, the goal of this paper was sort of the last dagger in, um, in Chiang. And there were, I mean, there were some efforts, be, I mean, there were plenty of people who weren't wild about Chiang, and in your book you make the point that there were people still well tossed around the idea of assassination, right, that right. FDR mm -hmm. had, you know, you know, um, and there, you know, as a possibility. I didn't come across anything, you know, any smoking gun in my period that, that there was a serious effort to assassinate Chung, but it's not, it's not the wildest, it's not the wildest thing. Atchison and Truman were, were interested in um, kind of bolstering a, a kind of third force on, yeah. on Taiwan yeah. during that period, and, and um, so, um, so anyway, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, Kevin, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for writing the book. Thank you for coming. Thank you.